My guest today is Dr. David Hochberg, a general practitioner from Atlanta, Georgia. David is a graduate of the late great Emory University, and he has been a well-known educator and leader in the field of implant dentistry. And in fact, he's the incoming president of the AAID. Welcome, David. Good morning. Good to see you, Neil. Nice to have you here. Nice to have it's you a here. pleasure to be here. So David, as I remember, when you first got out of dental school, your mm -hmm. first associateship was kind of a different arrangement than, than most people experience. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, it? Yeah, I sure can. You know, it really was. And uh, it goes back uh, a number of years. We don't have to divulge the date right now, but suffice to say, Emory had a dental school way back when. And uh, I came out of school and got my first position in what was then a group practice. And group practice settings in the early 80s weren't, weren't uh, seen all that often. The, uh, the leaders of this group was a family of periodontists, Dr. Marvin Sugarman, Edward Sugarman, and uh, Richard Sugarman. Well-known well people, right? The Sugarman Files? Uh, that, that's correct. Well-known, and Marvin was one of the developers of uh, periodontal surgical protocols in the uh, 40s and 50s. So I was very fortunate to be a general dentist in that practice. And what happened in that practice is I was, uh, ex uh, I was introduced to uh, techniques that related to implants that Edward Sugarman was doing. I really think Ed Sugarman was probably one of the first periodontists to be involved in understanding the benefits of restoring oral health with uh, dental implants. So the story goes like this. I was in operatory A, and he was in operatory B, and I heard this audible noise coming from operatory B. That sounded to me like a hammer and a nail. And of course, I got up and I looked at operatory B, and there he was with a surgical mallet, and he was placing a blade implant, which had to be hammered in, and that was the audible that I heard. So for me, my implant moment was a sound, and I never looked back. And he was my first mentor and was very gracious about sharing the early principles about implant placement with me. That followed by a trip to um, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where uh, Dr. Carl Misch, Dr. Lennon Linkow was there in a subperiosteal forum. I think Dr. Bob James was also there from uh, Loma Linda fame. And we took that course, and that subperiosteal Neil was m really my first implant when we came back to Atlanta. Wow. Uh, so this was before the, uh, the Bronemark uh, right. system? Right. We, historically, yeah. we're two years before that. Bronemark systems and osseous integrations, in my mind, always was 85-ish, right around that area. So this was 83, 84. And uh, back then, uh, single tooth replacement with implants uh, was available, but it wasn't as prominent as restoring edentulous arches. Sure, sure. So the subperiosteal uh, was the implant of choice back then, and um, I'm very fortunate that some of these patients stayed with my practice for the past 30 years, and they still have those restorations, and we really um, help the patient to improve their oral health and quality of life. Right, right. I mean, things really, really changed, right? In those days, before Bronemark system, people that were doing implants were really on the edge. Right? Oh, was, by all means. And then what happened was, um, was uh, people like uh, Dr. Jack Hahn came to Atlanta, and I remember distinctly um, uh, attending my first hands-on course for what they uh, called root form implants back then. And Dr. Jack Hahn and Dr. Duke Heller from Cincinnati, they came down, and um, I took my first courses from Dr. Hahn and have used his implant designs throughout the years, and he was an innovator and is an innovator. He, he simplified everything, and he always helped build confidence in a very, very wonderful manner uh, that let you um, feel that, uh, that, that if he could do it, I could do it, and that was his gift. And uh, I, I understand he's still very much involved with you folks today. Absolutely. Dr. Han is the designer of the, uh, of the Han implant system. Appropriately that, that named. Exactly. And, uh, and exactly as you say, David, <coughs> he, is, he is committed to having general practitioners place implants in a safe and predictable way and to make it a, a valuable and important part of your practice. So, so it's, uh, it's just as it was in the beginning of your career. It's, it's the same way. And, the same and it's, it's wonderful to see him and, and all that he has done continue in that fashion. So these were some of the early pioneers in, in implant dentistry. Um, and um, coincidentally or not coincidentally, they were all associated with the academy that I'm very proud of. Uh, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, uh, just from a historical standpoint, is really one of the oldest academies 
in the world that's dedicated to restoring and rehabilitating oral health in patients, and they have been doing it for some 66 years. That's actually older than me, and that's, that's kind of tough. <laughs> not by much. <laughs> not by much. And I have found there's been a common denominator for the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, and that common denominator is it's always been about the patient. So when you look back to Dr. Gershkoff and Dr. Goldberg, who were responsible for creating and placing the first subperiosteal implant, I don't know, somewhere around 1949, 1950, it was about the patient. And then following them came Dr. Leonard Linkow. And again, he took the concepts and protocols and shared it with the world. And it was still about the patient. And then their names that followed, many of which that we all know in the field, uh, was followed by Dr. Hill Tatum. And he created the sinus lift. Again, it was about the patient. And then, of course, this list is long and, and glorious, but Dr. Carl Misch you know, condensed everything to make procedures and protocols very, uh, very predictable in most anybody's hands. And again, all these people were American Academy of Implant Dentistry presidents, so I'm very honored to follow in that unbelievable path including Dr. Jack Hahn in that list. It's a great honor to, to lead that organization. Yeah, so tell me, you have, your, uh, you have your, your inauguration coming up soon. You'll, you'll take the reins of, of, that, I of will, that. I will take the reins of this wonderful organization that really has provided me with all of my implant education um, since I started this wonderful journey back in the early 80s. Uh, there was an educational opportunity that was presented to me uh, called the Maxi Course. I don't know if you've heard of the Maxi, because sure, I'm sure. sure you have. And the Maxi Course is a creation by the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. And when I was in the first, it was in Augusta, Georgia, where the then Medical College of Georgia School of Dentistry was, uh, was located. It still is located there. They've had a couple of name changes. But there was a dentist named Dr. Terry Reynolds, Neil. And he was the creator of this continuing education uh, module. And I remember driving from Atlanta, Georgia to Augusta, Georgia every weekend for nine months, uh, taking his courses. And he would have speakers come in uh, throughout the country. And that's where my initial education uh, was, was started. The whole program of MaxiCourse has grown. I mean, there are 17 of them. They are international. So it's a great place for people to get started in the profession. And if you're interested in being educated, you know, there are formal programs that are tried and true, and the Maxi course is one of them. Of course, there are many who have attended the Mission Institute, which is another one that you would have to mention. But I think the AID has educated upwards of 5,000 people. Many of them have gone on to become credentialed in our organization, uh, become active in the profession in, a, in an attempt to better serve their patients. Well, that, that's some good information about how to get the education needed to, to add implant dentistry to your practice. Tell me, in, in your, in, and I know you have, you have hundreds of colleagues around the country that you've <coughs> closely associated with over the years, but what kinds of mistakes have you seen doctors make as they add implant dentistry to their practice? You know, personally for me, um, I, I look back at my career and I never wanted to be out on that edge. I wanted to be within the envelope and I learned very early on that somebody with experience and expertise uh, shared with me their, their protocols and procedures. I followed them to the letter. I didn't write to recreate it. I wasn't changing it. Um, the case selection is critical when you're first starting out. Um, you don't want to do an immediate placed implant for your first case. I think first cases should be selected, uh, not only from an anatomical consideration, but on the patients. We have lovely patients and we have not so lovely patients. I think you want to select a lovely patient for this for first protocol and, and hopefully everybody understands what I mean by that. The other thing is the case that you select should be reasonably straightforward. You want a case that when you look at the x-ray or the CT scan, CBCT, that has large volumes of bone. And even better, you should select the case that's on your side of the chair. So if you're right-handed, you want to do something that's a number 30 or a number 5. If you're left-handed, pick something on the other side of the arch, like number 13 so or number they 19. Don't, they don't have mirrors in Atlanta? They have mirrors <laughs> in Atlanta. But you know, uh, doing your surgery in, in a rearview mirror backwards and upside down <laughs> poses some 
challenges. And, and then when you're comfortable with the anatomical considerations and you're comfortable with your patient selection, I think that's the first case. Now today, um, I think people uh, getting into our field has wonderful opportunities because there are mentors and teachers available in programs where you can actually secure that implant with the patient. There are cadaver courses, but you can bring your patient to one of these courses and place that implant. Not only that, even in your community, I would suggest hang on to somebody, get a mentor, join the AID, and that mentor will come to your office and be very helpful in guiding you. You know, it's all about confidence and feeling comfortable, whether it's a crown, whether it's a posterior composite, or whether it's a surgical placement of an implant. There's something very gratifying to take the patient through the whole procedures and protocols and, and really helping people that are husbands and wives and children throughout your career that uh, goes far beyond just um, uh, preparing an osteotomy and bone and screwing a screw in place. Okay, so, so here's what I got. I got pick a lovely patient. Lovely is mm -hmm. important. Pick the right site for the implant, Correct. adequate soft and hard tissue. Yes. Find a good mentor and color within the lines. I think Don't color outside the lines in your first few right, cases. Right, and, 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 and I think that that's hard and fast, and I think anybody who's knee-deep in education would, would share that with you. And you know, I always like to be a sponge. You just want to soak up everything that the person ha who has the experience and the longevity. And, and if you follow those things, Dr. Carl Misch set those protocols very, very strict, and uh, you'll find that predictability will come in doing it in that fashion. David, there's, there's been a lot of talk recently about legal decisions that have been made in certain states and, and the idea of, of implant dentistry becoming a, a specialty of dentistry. W what's your position on that? Or can you kind of summarize that for, for our viewers? I can certainly summarize it. That has been ongoing for many years, and I think every president before me had the hopes of specialty status being bestowed during their presidency. So for 25 years this has been the case. I certainly believe, and so does the AID, that there's a, a place in, in oral health care for implant dentistry to certainly be a specialty. And that battle is still going on at state to state and board to board. Uh, it will happen, I cannot predict when, but I can tell you today we are much further along in that road and that path uh, than we were even five years ago. So uh, uh, keep abreast of that, and we'll be the first people to advise everybody when that happens. Uh, David, I, I've known you for, for many years. You have uh, an outstanding restorative practice in Atlanta that you've had for many years. And I know that recently you added a intraoral scanner, digital scanner, to your practice. Tell me a little bit about how that affected uh, the old dog and the new tricks. Yeah, well, it, exactly. And you're looking at the old dogs, and <laughs> I contemplate, do I need to do this at this point in my career, or do I not? And I've always added technology, Neil, um, appropriately. I was never a big bells and whistles guy just to say that I had a laser, the latest I had to provide a service to the patient. So when I was shopping the market and I was looking into intraoral scanners, I decided to go with the trios. And sometimes you have reservations. I have not a reservation. The whole concept of CAM technology in your practice, whether it's a CBCT scan or whether it's a trios unit, has just been incredible. The idea of going into an operatory without impression material is, is wonderful. Scan bodies that are utilized to make um, impressions for prosthetics for dental implants are the rule of thumb now. Um, pick up copings and having the patient gag in your office. My laboratory is the cleanest room in my office. <laughs> uh, there's no stone, there's no mess. The assistants clean up quicker. There's no trays to try in. And not only that, it's really accurate. But one of the best things is the ability for the dentist to communicate with their lab like Glidewell. So you make your scan, it emails it's the, that large file to, to Glidewell, and it's actually in the possession of the laboratory before your patient gets back to the car. <laughs> um, technician at, at the source picks up and looks at the scan virtually on the, on the screen, and if they have a problem, if they see something's not, not quite right, instead of sending you back, the entire model with a pencil mark made to call the patient to come back in to repack the tooth or the implant and make another impression, you have an actually an intelligent discussion on exactly where this area needs to be scanned. You call your patient, they come back in, you want to enhance it, and you just go back 
to that spot because it's stitched together. It really is, is, is the future. And as you incorporate uh, three-dimensional printers and uh, milling machines, which has been around for a while, from the scan, from the CBCT to the scan, to the patient is a seamless flow uh, that I think has changed dentistry. It may be one of the biggest changes I've seen in my career. I think so. I think so. And you know, it's it's part of this workflow, right? So so as you That's the as you do this scan and you can make the decision, or, you know, maybe you want to create the restoration in your office with chairside milling. Maybe you want to send it to the laboratory. You have a choice of laboratories. You have a choice of materials that you can use, and it, it really opens things up for for a lot of great new restorations for patients. It does, and and it's it's a it's a incredible wow for the patient because you share your scan with them after you're done and. Seeing a three-dimensional image of your mouth or your teeth is, they always say, is that my mouth? <laughs> well, yeah, we just did this right now, so uh, yes, it's everything right. you said. Now, has it made your preparations better? No, they're, they're much better. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, we really appreciate you joining us here, and I want to close with the, the big question. What do you see as the future for implant dentistry? I think the future for implant dentistry, Neil, is, is huge. Uh, the uh, acceptance of the protocols and procedures are well established in the profession. Uh, more professionals, oral health care providers, are including uh, implant dentistry in their practice. You have millions of patients that are thrilled and uh, getting through their day not thinking about their teeth and joining the prosthetic reconstructions that dental implants offer in the most natural way possible. So the future is, is, is really um, uphill and wonderful for everybody in my academy and everybody in the profession. Uh, also, the, um, uh, the, uh, the academy offers continuing education in the form of lots of meetings. As a matter of fact, we're going to be coming back here next April, and I think it's April 20 to 21st, for a special follow-up to a program that was probably about 10 years old called Focus on the Sinus. And they're going to have clinicians here uh, explaining and teaching those protocols on sinus grafting. I believe the originator of the procedure, Dr. Hill Tatum, will be here as well. And if you never seen him present or speak, that's something not to miss. Uh, the uh, involvement of Glidewell in these programs is much appreciated. Uh, it seems that Glidewell understands what to uh, uh, support and how to support it. And the American Academy is, is very pleased with that. And I guess on my closing note, I'm certainly proud and humbled to be um, assuming this position for the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. You know, it's been my implant home for 30 some odd years and uh, without my academy, I probably wouldn't be sitting here before these cameras. So I encourage, encourage everybody, all practitioners to become involved in this field. I think you'll find it beneficial and I know your patients will as well. Well, I wish you a great year of your presidency and I appreciate you coming to join us today. Thank you for having me.